How do you beat boredom, Tyler? Adventure. Sometimes in life you have to have faith. Put fear aside and follow your heart. And sometimes your heart leads you to a road, an unknown path that you also follow. And that road leads to an adventurous experience that creates memories that will last for the rest of your life. I could have dwelled on the potential for what could go wrong. Vehicle breakdown, perhaps, but more likely flat tires or a cracked windshield. The road I was about to drive had a reputation for doling out both. I learned long ago that if you allow it, your mind will concoct scenarios that most of the time never materialize. I'd heard the stories about the windshields and flats, about the dire possibility of breaking down in such a remote place. But the main thing in any journey is simply to take the first step and set the journey in motion. Setting a journey in motion may not be easy, but things seem to, for the most part, fall into place after that. If you wait until you think everything is perfect to set off, you'll never go. Sometimes a seed is planted in the fertile soil of the mind, where it may lie dormant for years, even decades. Then one day, watered by thoughts and nurtured by imagination, that seed sprouts into a call to action. That call to action sends out tendrils wrapping around logistics. Soon it buds into a plan, which in turn begins to grow into the makings of a journey. This is the story of how a seed became a journey that blossomed with adventure. Rock Hopper here, and I'm about to embark on literally the wildest journey yet. Join me as we drive to the top of the world on the road trip of a lifetime. <laughs> Not far beyond the outer reaches of Dawson City, Yukon, where the Klondike Gold Rush occurred in the late 1800s, is the beginning of the Dempster Highway, one of the world's great drives to the northernmost reaches of the North American continent. I would be heading all the way to its end at the Arctic Ocean, passing small towns like Fort McPherson and Inuvik, and my mind had already anticipated what I might see along the way, as this lonely ribbon of gravel threaded through some of the last large tracts of wild and almost completely unspoiled landscapes. This wasn't a place to have a problem, as there were no emergency services along the route, and even places to have a car serviced were very limited. I crossed what would be the first of many rivers, and soon saw a travel advisory on a flashing sign, likely due to the fires burning along the way. It was 880 kilometers to the Arctic Ocean, or about 550 miles, and the next gas was 370 kilometers away. It all began in the late 1990s when I rode a mountain bike from Lakeview, Oregon to the Yukon and Alaska, a journey that would total over 4,000 miles by the time I completed it. While in the Yukon, I'd heard of a road that ran through some of the most remote and wild wilderness remaining on the planet. I thought, if I do another journey in the Yukon, I should drive the legendary Dempster Highway. At the time, it traveled as far as Inuvik, but as of late 2017, it opened up all the way to Tuktoyaktuk, which sits beside the Arctic Ocean. Tuk, as it's called, is a tiny settlement which had only been accessible by plane, boat, or on an ice road during the winter. I would have done it when it only went as far as Inuvik, but now with the road extended to the tiny settlement of Tuck, there was an added incentive to go. This idea of traveling through one of the last remaining great wildernesses on earth stirred visions of seeing grizzly and black bears, wolverine and lynx, and the regal looking creatures and symbols of the far north, the caribou, and the potential to meet people with ancient ties to the land around them enticed me further. My grandmother was an Inuvialic Eskimo from the north. What would I see and find along the way? It was time to find out. I'd wintered near the border of Mexico and spent some time in Algodones, Mexico. Now I was leaving Yuma, Arizona on a quest heading north toward Canada. Through Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana, and into British Columbia. Through the years I'd occasionally had dreams of the far north, I'd traveled to the Arctic in my mind and had seen the colors of the ocean there. Would the colors match those of my dreams? Hi! 
Where are you heading? To Edmonton. Oh, I'm heading to Tux. So, and I have no room, but good luck to you. Oh, thank, thank you, and for you too. And you're from Poland? Yes. From Poland. Well, good luck. Have yeah. a great trip. Bye. See you. The start of my journey up the Dempster was delayed due to the fires burning alongside it. When it reopened, I quickly made my move as I was concerned that it may close again. I didn't drive all this way for nothing. Now, I hope the highway stayed open because if I got more than 200 miles into this and was forced to turn back, I would likely be at the point of no return with not enough gas to head back south to refuel and be left stranded with an empty tank. I completely topped the tank to the point where I couldn't get in another drop. There was gas in the tank and adrenaline in my veins. This is what adventure is all about. About a half hour into the drive, the road seemed reasonably smooth so far, and I was averaging 45 to 50 miles per hour all the way to Tombstone Territorial Park. Here, mountains were smothered in a haze of smoke that obscured their tops from view. If I could snap my fingers and get rid of the smoke, this is what you'd see. I had hoped to do a hike in the area, but put that idea on hold for the return trip south, hoping that by then the smoke would have cleared. Some people are dumpster divers, and some people are dempster drivers. Yeah, I'm driving the dempster, baby. People do live along the dempster highway, and occasionally you'll see places such as this, which are private property, so please respect those. With the sun behind a veil of smoke, it cast an eerie glow. It felt as if I were traveling in a strange dream and taking a road trip to the apocalypse. All of western Canada was burning. The road eventually got rougher, more washboards and potholes, slowing my average to 30 miles per hour, and an abandoned car that looked as if it had veered off the road added to the apocalyptic vibe. The dempster is built atop permafrost and is undergoing constant maintenance. Eventually I had my first view of open tundra and took in the vastness of the region. The kilometers rolled by, and as they did, the tundra surrendered to the mountains with their forests and large valleys. At the 175-kilometer marker, I was surprised at how good the road conditions were. I'd driven much worse roads elsewhere. However, if I cut up to a slower car, or if a car passed me, I was enveloped in a cloud of dust, and for a few seconds could see little else. When a large truck rolled past, forget about seeing anything. With all the smoke and dust and limited visibility, it was like driving a hellish inferno on a road to nowhere. So what's tundra composed of anyway? Let's have a look. Now you got some horsetail there. And over here, well, you got some grass and you've got some moss here. Type of berry over here. And you've got lichen in through here. Uh, this looks like this might be a type of berry bush. You got some of those plants. And uh, I think this is willow here. And when you walk on the ground, it's really spongy. You sink in a bit, so when this stuff's wet, it would be pretty difficult trudging through it. Distances are very big here, so we are heading toward Inuvik, and then we continue on to Tuk to Yuk Tuk. It's plenty warm out here, 77, at 6.32 p.m. This is Two Moose Lake, and it's known as a permafrost lake. It thaws and it refreezes. Underneath it is just a lot of permafrost which can actually go a hundred feet or more down and moose do come here to uh, feed and one of their favorite well probably the favorite food of them is pondweed and did you know they can actually dive down in the water to get to it I found what I think is a pretty darn nice place to park it for the evening got the fire going on down here see my car parked there river back there Sweet, eh? Dinner's on, did some foraging, found some lamb's quarter, dandelion, and fireweed to go with the spaghetti. And there's some red onion in there as well. Throw in that sauce and good to go. Lamb's quarter right here, fireweed right here. And here's the kicker, there's hardly any mosquitoes here. The smoke might diminish the views, but it doesn't diminish the experience. Those bizarre smoke sunsets. They're surreal, aren't they?
The smoke's cleared up a bit this morning. There's actually outhouses here at a rest area. The Dempster Highway isn't the only highway that goes north of the Arctic Circle. There's also the Dalton in Alaska, the one that goes up to Prudhoe Bay, does so as well, and it actually goes up a little bit higher north than this one. However, there were two main reasons why I chose the Dempster over the Dalton. One is, I didn't want to just go through all some of the most scenic and unspoiled wilderness left on earth over in Alaska only to end up at an industrial site full of pipelines, possibly smokestacks spewing burning methane and find at the end of the road uh, housing for the workers that looks like it should be a space colony on Mars. Uh, somehow that just seemed like it would be a real downer plus you are not allowed to go to the Arctic Ocean up there. You actually have to purchase a ticket get on a tour bus and you have a limited time. At the end of the Dempster you can actually camp apparently right on the Arctic Ocean or very close to it. And also at the end of the road there is not an industrial site. So after going through some of the most beautiful wilderness left on earth here through the Yukon and Northwest Territories you end up at an indigenous village I guess Tuktoyaktuk. Uh, I haven't been there of course but gonna see what that's all about. So you get like a native cultural experience which to me seems way better. In a nutshell, a heritage site beats an industrial site and getting to stay by the Arctic Ocean for free as long as you want beats potentially having to pay to see it for a little while. For anybody unfamiliar with Prudhoe Bay, that's where the Alaskan oil pipeline begins. I heard a loon calling out on this lake. Let's see if Red Creek is really red. It does look pretty red at the edges. The river itself looks more like a yellow ochre color though. And just down the road from Red Creek is Sulphur Spring, which has a totally different color of the water. And it's not a hot spring, it's cold water. And a lot of mosquito larvae swimming around in it. The smoke infiltrated the clarity, smothering the landscape in a gray haze, which made it seem like I was driving in a strange dream. And then suddenly, big mountains appear through the smoke. If I drive it all night, will I be free? Hey cool, maybe that was a wolf I saw. These are the kind of dogs you want in this part of the world. Check it out, across the river, got the first touches of fall color coming in. And in the winter, I'm sure there's a lot of snow that could be coming down. Some pretty mountains there though, huh? That up there is known as the Notch. When I first came into Canada, there weren't all these fires up in the Yukon. There were quite a few in BC and a few in Alberta, but I think there was maybe one, maybe none, going on in the Yukon at the time. So I thought, well, I'll head up here and it'll be fine, but apparently a lot of them have been started since I entered Canada and a lot of lightning strikes and such. So that explains all this, this smoke, because there's these fires apparently all around, and it's just belching a lot of smoke into the area. And all this smoke is really giving me some health issues. Uh, my throat is sore and raspy, I'm having some sinus issues. It's kind of like I've got a cold almost at times, uh, just you know, sniffly, and my eyes are a little bit watery and stuff like that. Sign says we're entering the Vuntut Gwich'in lands. Run that rocket. Getting close to the Arctic Circle.
Things have been going great, but now we've experienced what the Dempster apparently is famous for, flat tires. So, uh, we gotta change this, and uh, Eagle Plains is up the road, maybe 20, 30 miles, so maybe they've got a f place to fix flats. Well, that's looking pretty low. Good thing I got a tire inflator. That's good enough. Let's go. Well, that's just great. Because of the lay of the land here, where it slopes just slightly, I'm about an eighth of an inch short of being able to get the wheel back on, so I've got to do something else. Could let the air out of the spare, but that's going to take a long time to fill it back up. So I just put the old flat tire back on there, and I'll just move the car enough to get a better angle and be able to get the spare on there. Well, it took a few extra minutes, but hey, you know, got the tire on there. So let's head on into Eagle Plains. Somebody said it's about 25 miles from here, or 39 Ks. And uh, they stopped to see if I was okay, because the trucker up ahead had asked them to check on me. So in we go, Eagle Plains. I don't think anything's going to be open, because it's probably about six, yeah, six o'clock right now, I think, somewhere around there. You know how they say look on the bright side? Well, let's do that. So I only had to back up maybe a hundred yards to get into the space to get off the highway where it was a lot safer. And there was enough wind to keep most of the mosquitoes away. I only got a few bites. And hey, it's not raining or freezing cold, right? So look on the bright side. I was told they used to gravel this road with shale and shale has very sharp edges and it'd be like driving across a road of knives and there used to be a ton of flat tires on here there are less now because they no longer use shale apparently we're literally going through the fire it's still smoking I would cruise slowly as I couldn't risk getting another flat and find a place in Eagle Plains to get the tire fixed, I hoped. Luckily, I caught them shortly before closing. This is our opportunity to get the tire fixed, hopefully. I'm here in Eagle Plains, and yes, there is a place to get your tires fixed, your flats fixed, so I'm doing that right now. Got the car back and drivable again now. We're using the spare as the main tire, and we're gonna use that tire as the spare because there was some damage to the inside probably when I kept driving because it was uh, I heard some thumps when I heard the third thump I stopped but uh, there was a little bit of wear on the inside so he suggested I use a spare okay got gas um, nah, I don't think that's gonna clean the windshield no We'll move on. Might as well top up with drinking water while we're here. That's the mileage from Dawson City to here at Eagle Plains. At least that's what I did. That's a rather eerie, apocalyptic scene right now with the sun and the burning fires in the distance with the smoke rising. I was told that the fire doesn't kill most of the trees, that it's a tundra fire that smolders and burns along and through the ground. The ground is burning. This is what it looks like at three in the morning. It's still light, but the sun is behind the smoke. Back to the apocalypse. You want a belly scratch? You want a belly scratch? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm back at the tire place in Eagle Plains and we have a valve stem issue on the tire we put on last night. Okay, we're putting in a new valve stem right now. Here inside the Eagle Plains Hotel you might find a husky greeting you from his couch in the lobby. This is the bar at Eagle Plains. A little information about it there. Okay, let's try this again. We're leaving Eagle Plains. It's in the side view mirror behind us. 
And we're heading out to the dusty and smoky frontier ahead of us. Last night, after getting the flat repaired, I went only six miles beyond Eagle Plains, which turned out to be a good thing, because I discovered in the morning that air was leaking from the valve stem when I checked the tire pressure before I was about to set off. Otherwise, I would have kept going, while more air leaked, potentially putting me in a worse situation, especially if the new tire sustained damage. And I parked it just kind of over, over there. Last night. I've not been in good shape with all this smoke. I've been coughing a lot, had sinus headaches, sniffles, my ears last night were getting all plugged up. So it's, yeah, it's like I have a cold or something, but it's just the smoke, it's so bad. I just passed somebody else with a flat tire and a friendly trucker stop to help the girls out. They're gonna have to go into Eagle Plains and get that flat fixed, or maybe even a new tire, depending on how bad it is. I have reached the Arctic Circle. I am here. Not wanting to risk getting another flat tire, as I was told that the tire I'm now using as a spare should be treated as gingerly as a donut spare because it's lost some of its structural integrity, I've slowed my speed to 20 to 30 miles per hour. I think getting the flat was a message to ease up. There's no hurry, and take some time to really enjoy all that's out here. I really miss oxygen and breathing properly, so I'm going to have a couple of mints. Hopefully, maybe that'll help. Hmm. Hello, little buddy. How are you doing there? What you up to? Welcome to the Northwest Territories. Here is the land of the Gwich'in people, who have subsistence hunted the migrating herds of caribou for thousands of years. Trees became less prevalent, and tundra, dominated the landscape, which was occasionally punctuated by mountains. I turned off the highway to have a brief look at the settlement of Midway Lake, which appeared to be a native community. I said hello to a local woman as I drove past slowly and stopped to chat. She mentioned that she was looking for a couple of puppies that apparently fell off the back of a truck. I told her I'd look for them and would bring them back if I found them. She then said, I just missed a good music festival that took place a few days earlier, where there was quite the party atmosphere, and that everyone was welcome to pitch a tent if they liked. Like the music festival. I never saw the dogs either. All right, time to take the ferry. Looks like we're up. Here we go. And that's where we'll park. We are on the other side. The river highway, loading everything up to big tanker trucks. Welcome to Fort McPherson. I just had a really nice meal here in Fort McPherson because I was the guest of Lynn and Paul who <laughs> live here. What can you guys tell me about Fort McPherson? Yeah, Fort McPherson is a small community in the Northwest Territories. And uh, we we live just about 85 kilometers from the Yukon border here, and uh, we're a, a community of about a thousand people. Uh, and one of the communities that are the smattering of communities uh, across the Northwest Territories, and it's a First Nations community, native, native community, and uh, yeah. It's, Beautiful place without when it when it's not smoky. smoky. <laughs> yeah. I'm here at a fish camp along the Peel River, and they're going to bring in the day's catch, and I'm going to show you how to cook the fish. He's coming in with the fish right now. There's today's catch. This is Deborah, and she's going to start cutting fish. We're going to cut the heads off, and then we're going to let them sleep for a half hour. The fish that we're cutting, this is the white fish that we get from the Peel River. This is called the crooked back. We use this for the intestines. Those that want to learn how to cut fish, we mostly get them to use this one. This one here is called a coney. 
which some people call, but which, which is known by in canoe. In canoe. Yeah, and the heads and the fins we cook to the fire. We cook the intestines to the fire, and then we make dry fish and fish strips. We make dry fish with these little ones, with these big ones. We make fish fish sticks because they're very popular. So as you can see, we're saving the fins here, and then we'll be saving the guts, the fish guts. And then if you, these are the sticks that we use to put the fish strips on. And if you come with me, I'll show you. This is the dry fish that we just, we make with it. We just kind of unfold it from the backbone. And this is the backbones that come from it. You boil this after it's half smoked, you boil it and you eat it with onions, very delicious. We hang the fish sticks up here and then the final stage is they come to here. And once they come here, they're, they dry and it takes a couple of... This was just started yesterday, so these are ready. This fish house and the next one are filled with this stuff here. And the next fish house some, is for somebody else to use, but right here is the backbones that hang. We smoke them and then we give them out to the elders. One of the most favorite sought out piece of the fish. We take these and we put them on a fire and it won't be long. And right here is some of the fish guts we cooked from the previous haul. Pony heads and the fins. This one here is the fish sticks. You eat it with butter. And this one here is what we had hanging in the fish house there. We make dry fish with the white fish and fish sticks with the coney. And that's the fish guts that she just served you. And this is bannock right here. Okay, I'm gonna try this. Okay. Good eating down here on the Peel River. Okay, this is a fin. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's good. This is coney head and this is a delicacy here. Thank you. Just came off the fire. Okay, this is the coney head. Mm. It's good. Right on, eh? That's a nice big chunk of coney head right there. Mm -hmm. What are we doing now? We are making dry fish. We cut it in half and then we put the fish guts up here. And now we're going to make fish, dry fish like the ones you've seen hanging in the hanging in the smokehouse. So you'll see Donna here how she's splitting the fish the way like to see how I got it like this. And I'm splitting it on each side and then this part reaches the guts and the way she's doing it that's the way I'm going to do it too. And okay. then it's going to be in the we're going to hang it up in the smokehouse and dry and then we share it with others. Sellers food, we always share with people, and that's just the way we are raised from our elders and ancestors. We share all our tra traditional food with our people and with other people that we just meet. Get caribou, moose, fish, any kind of fish we use, and also berries. We pick berries and we make jam. And she's our teacher. She teaches us how to make dry fish. Her name is Emily. Hi, I'm Emily and I'm going to make fish strips. I'm going to cut this. That's dry fish. You're making dry fish and I make fish strips. Soft but I'll try. So Emily's making fish, fish strips. strips. That's a fish strip. He's trying his hand here. He's learned to cut fish. This is Ernest, and he's 80 years old. And what's your thought about aging, Ernest? It's bullshit. <laughs> Don't believe in old age. That's what I said. I use that on myself. <laughs>
I only do something I do. Then I talk later. I don't talk about something I'm going to do. You do, then you can talk, not before. So do it while you can. Yeah. That's good advice. I can't do one thing. That, I do need to lift about 2010. I was on a major operation. I took off of my stomach with that stomach cancer. I got a phone call about a week ago. Doctor told me that how I feel. I said, okay. I took three, two pills. Told me to throw one away. The last pill you don't need to have to take it. You're okay. You got no cancer, nothing. You studied my cancer for 10 years. So that's the good news that I got. Now I'm young again. I told you I'm going to live to be 150 years old. Well, I hope you do. <laughs> well, you got to think positive. Huh? You can't give up. <laughs> oh, I hope you do get to be 150. Yeah. Maybe I'll come up for the birthday party. Yeah. We're just sitting here by the Peel River over there. We're sitting here eating our breakfast. So it's a good morning here at Peel River. Yep. Feeling pretty good today. Paul connected me with a place to take a shower inside a church just across from his house there. And also got a nice little lunch going on today, so uh, yeah, you know, the late start, yeah, no worries, it'll, it'll all work out. Besides, I've got no place to be and all day to get there, right? As I drive farther north, the days get longer. Therefore, I find that I'm staying up later at night. In southern Canada, I was going to sleep around 10, but now find that I'm not laying my head on my pillow until about 11. The sunset here can last for hours, and it never gets completely dark in the summer. That's where you put people who are really annoying. I think this house has seen better days. I would say so. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I think time did stop here. Inside, it's a pretty simple place. Somebody left some photos behind. Family photos. And a few other things, but not much else. This place appears to be abandoned for about 15 years. I almost never take anything with me, but in that old shack back there, I found this Northwest Territories license plate, and I thought, hey, that'd make kind of a cool souvenir. Take it along. There's our ferry coming across the mighty Mackenzie. There's a big barge out there hauling things up the river. They could probably call this the Mississippi River of the North. Time to get on the ferry. We are here again at the front of the ferry. Coming in. After some thought, I decided, hey, why not just park it right here at the Mackenzie River? It's kind of like a little ocean right here with the little waves lapping. I've got the time, so why not? I didn't get very far today, but that's okay. You know, it's not about making mileage. It's about experiencing the place. Parking it for the night on a little beach at the mighty Mackenzie River in one of the wildest places left on earth sitting next to a nice campfire made from driftwood life is good right now you might think I'm living life like there's no tomorrow and well if you want to think that alright truth is there's no ironclad guarantee there will be a tomorrow for you I had a cousin and he was only a little bit older than me He's dead now. Live your life. Get out there while you can. Just like Ernest said, you gotta get out there and live it. And you guys that have to go to the office tomorrow, I feel for you. Same for you guys that are gonna be sitting in front of your computers all day in your own homes working. So I'm out here living the adventure for you. And hey, I can watch the ferry float like a ghost ship through the smoke until I fall asleep. Two bald eagles to start the morning. Right outside my window. There's one, and there's the other one. The morning started out a bit chilly, but the wind finally blew some of the smoke away. Suddenly, a wolverine jumped out in front of my car and started loping down the road. I reached for the camera as I braked to avoid hitting him. He quickly disappeared back into the bush before I could film him. I got out and looked for him, and instead saw what looked to be a muskrat and some ducks. 
Wow, a wolverine. I was getting jealous that people had seen like caribou or grizzly bear, but I think a wolverine is probably the rarest sighting out here. I don't know that, but I think they're pretty elusive, so I'm pretty stoked. Uh, I forever have that etched in my memory right now. Just, you know, for seeing that wolverine just like lumbering and running in front of my car. And I was hoping he would come back and try and cross the road again. I might be able to film him, but he obviously got pretty scared and ran way off into the bush. So I don't think he's coming back for a long time. Wolverine track. There's Wolverine tracks. Right there, I just saw him. He's right in here somewhere. There he is. He's right down there. Let's head out this trail to the viewpoint. Quite a few of them. Look at them all. The wind and the clouds have come in and blown the smoke away. Some things you might want to know if you're coming up this way is uh, bears are not out to get you. They're not everywhere and you shouldn't worry about them too much. Just be respectful of their space. Also, when I got into Canada, my cell phone no longer worked. And the same might happen to you unless you get the entire North American plan for your phone. This is in regard to crimes committed against indigenous women and girls. You're kidding me. There's pavement here? Welcome to Inuvik, the big town of the far north. I stopped in the welcome center here and picked up a little magnet. That'll go well with my car. Plane up there. The bright colors make the hospital easy to find. Up ahead was the Western Arctic Regional Visitor Center, and that sounded like a good place to check out. Here they had free recipes for bannock you can take with you. There were also displays highlighting the local culture and traditions as well as the wildlife of the region such as the musk ox and the caribou on which the local people have traditionally relied on for their survival. Yeah, that's a big boy right there. They've got free hot water for your tea, so I grabbed a tea bag and tossed it in the cup. Good to go. In Nuvik, post office to the left, McKenzie Hotel. Got something to the right. Let's have a look at that. Turns out it's a Roman Catholic church. Let me show you the church. Often called the Igloo Church, it was completed in 1960, built mainly by volunteers. Brother Maurice Larocq, a Catholic missionary to the Arctic who had previously been a carpenter, designed the church despite having no formal architectural training or serious construction experience, sketching it on two sheets of plywood that are in the building's upper stories. It's the only major building in town not on pilings. The wood for it was floated down the Mackenzie River from Fort Smith, some 1,200 miles away. It's the most photographed building in town. The round, igloo-like shape was created to offset any potential damage that might be created by frost heaves. Here's a look up into the church, upstairs. Located where the boreal forest transitions to tundra, Inuvik is a town of 3,500 people. It was created in the late 1950s to replace flood-prone Aklavik on the Mackenzie as the main center for the region. Temperatures can soar to the mid-80s Fahrenheit in summer and plummet to minus 40 degrees in winter. 24-hour darkness lasts for about a month in winter while in the summer daylight is endless for about two months. The aurora borealis can light up the night sky, particularly in winter. Here in Inuvik, you can drop by the Western Arctic Research Center and pick up a free little booklet on the medicinal and edible plants in the region. And you can stroll through the gardens and see the plants themselves. Here at the Midnight Sun Complex, they've got a full-size hockey rink if you're interested in that, and also they do curling. What are you doing? Can I help you? You're just going to hang out. Well, what do you have to say for yourself? Anything? You just like it up there, do you? Yeah? Uh-huh. Well, it's my car. 
You can't drive, no. I'm not gonna let you drive. Well, little squirrel, you're not old enough to drive yet. That's one reason. You like the view from up there? Is that what you're trying to tell me? You don't want to leave, huh? You don't want to leave. Well, I'd kind of like it if you did leave. Yeah. You can go. No. Well. Well, no need to get upset about it. You know, just leave. You got up there. I can't chase you all around the car. Okay, that's better. Bye-bye. I'm here at Alice Dean's restaurant, met some fellow travelers, and we're all gonna have a meal here, and they're gonna tell us a little bit about themselves and how they ended up here. So we'll start with you, Lise. Okay, very short. <laughs> my name is Lise, I'm from Montreal, Quebec. Uh, I left uh, my town May 29, traveling through Canada, Yukon, Alaska, and I met uh, Nora Lee, and that was great because I was not supposed to do the depth trip and either the top of the world and finally I say okay let's go so I'm here now all right <laughs> I'm Alec uh, I'm a grad student at Dartmouth College and I'm here to study erosion in the Richardson Mountains I'm Bailey I'm also a grad student at Dartmouth College and I my research also deals with like climate change and sort of like the the like how we think about like the way that like Glaciers look swell. <laughs> Oops! <laughs> the glacier really swell. Oh, I feel that. It's like energy. <laughs> oh my god. I can't even die. Billy. So that's really good for your, for your trip. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks for that real-life reenactment of a glacier moving. Um, okay, so finish up with what you were saying. That's pretty much it. Glacial history <laughs> through geology. Oh, okay. oh. Can I also oh. say that she does very exact and precise science that requires like, finesse with her hands yes. and dexterity. Fine motor control. Yeah, you can... Yeah. All right. Well, now that you've had the real fill of the glacial water on your pants, uh, let's hear about you. Well, uh, I'm Nathan. I'm a student at University of Arkansas, working on my PhD, uh, studying frost cracking, kind of how rocks break down at the surface in cold temperatures. I'm Jill. I'm a professor at the University of Arkansas. I'm one of the people that wrote the grant to help fund the grad students to come here and do some awesome research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm Nora Lee from the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska, and the dumpster was my bucket list that I've been wanting to do for many, many years, so now I'm doing it, and I'm loving it, and it's even better with a travel partner, at least Aww. from Montreal. <laughs> and the best part of traveling for me is meeting people and, and Things that happen. <laughs> <laughs> <Like glaciers. laughs> hey, and who's that person in the back here? <laughs> I'm Donna. I live in Maydock, Ontario, right now, and um, I'm originally from Toronto. And we went up to Tuk Tuk yesterday. So we've met some of these people along our travels, and uh, it's been an amazing experience. And that's one of the interesting things is you do meet up with people yes. over and yeah. over sometimes on the yeah. dumpster. We actually met another couple from Switzerland who had a rented van and we had seen them several times at different places along at Rock River Campground in Ontario, or sorry, not Ontario, Yukon and different places. And they lost their step off the back of their van. They told us that in talk yesterday. They said, we, we can't find our step. We think it fell off on the, on the trip between here in Nuvik to Tuk Tuk Tuk. And we looked for it and we found it. So we just gave it back to them a few minutes ago. <laughs> And we actually have met them maybe five or six times in random places all over the place. We just got our food. That's some poutine there. I got the white fish. I think she got the white fish. And then we got, what do we have over here? White fish and it's delicious. White fish. Fish tacos. Fish tacos over on this side here. Fish tacos. It's a fox. Looks like a snowshoe hare. I'm gonna gas it up here in Inuvik. 
There are a couple places in Nuvik where you can get groceries. This is one of them. Be prepared to pay the price. North Mart is the other place where you can get groceries and supplies. And you might find a few things you don't ordinarily see in your local store. Stopped in Stanton's Market here, got some granola bars and 50% off on the hazelnuts. And they were giving away free grapes, so it turned out to be a pretty good stop. $16.49 for the granola bars, free grapes, and uh, half price on the hazelnuts. Uh, cost me about 10 bucks. So let's head up the road to Tuck to Yuck Tuck. There's your stoplight. Probably the only one for 500 miles. And I hit it. An all day rain seemed to have washed the tourists away, at least for now, as I drove into town on a quiet Sunday morning to find nearly empty streets. I got back on the road, destined to reach the end of the highway at Tuck, and was soon in the big wide open again. Sometimes the only sound out here at all is the sound of the wind. Occasionally, I can hear some distant bird calls. Behind we Chasing the sunset Hoping I make it For it's too late it can actually eat these little berries. It was confirmed at the Arctic Regional Center there. And they're not bad. Lots of these little berries out here. Autumn's beauty is already starting to light up the landscape. A quick stop for some blueberries. That a person could just take off from this highway and walk in a straight line that way for a hundred miles. Or in a straight line that way on the other side of the highway for a hundred miles and not encounter anybody. It stirs my imagination, touches my heart, and lights up my soul that there's still something left like that in the world. Welcome to Tuck, land of the pingos it says. These cones right out here, those are called pingos and what they are is an ice filled cone and they're slowly rising over time, in about a thousand years, they'll quit rising up and eventually they'll be starting to erode back down. So check back in with Rock Hopper Adventures in a thousand years when I come back out here to film that. I wonder if they have pingos for dingoes, mate. The Arctic Ocean. Yeah. As far as the road will take you. After this, it's just water. Many people celebrate reaching the highway's end by jumping into the Arctic Ocean, but I took it further by starting a new tradition. I drank a gulp of its seawater so that the Arctic Ocean was literally a part of me. The colors of the Arctic that I'd seen in my dreams, the green of tundra, the grays, greens and blues of the sea, depending on its mood, did indeed turn out to be the true colors of the North. The golf course sucks the water dry While the weary travelers roast and fry Animated corpses grin I won't pass this way again there were several takeaways that I got from this journey. One is, what a disrespectful and polluting species we are toward nature. It didn't matter if it was a lake in Mexico, the United States, or the farthest northern reaches of Canada. They had bottles and cans tossed into them. River shores had plastic alongside the banks. Though great effort was involved in getting an item to a user in a remote area, it might be abandoned at the very spot where it lost its usefulness. This was particularly evident in Arctic Canada. Another is what an enormous footprint humans have made on the continent and the accompanying widespread alteration of the land because of it. Almost every paved, gravel, and even many dirt roads lead to or are lined with some type of development. And there was the alteration from forest to fields, from fields to housing tracks, and so on. I discovered how extremely difficult it is to find a place of true quiet Wherever people go, they bring the mechanized world with them. Generators, chainsaws, vehicles, boats, and so on. Even far beyond Tuktoyaktuk, 
there was the rumbling of jets flying their polar routes at 35,000 feet. It's amazing that we have such a huge landmass available to us to freely explore in North America. But the most astounding takeaway for me was how wondrous and magnificent the last few large remnants of unspoiled nature are. The last big tracts of wildness on Earth that were minimally impacted by human beings and are, for the most part, still pristine. A place where animals still roam free and where man is mostly a passing visitor. Therefore, I give my defense to these last surviving open spaces. The eyes and soul and mind need to wander as much as, maybe more than, the physical being. When I look across a lake devoid of marinas, docks, and pollution, or deep into an untrammeled mountain valley, I find visual freedom. As my eyes trace a line up to glowering peaks iced with snow, I feel freedom. It is a great comfort to the mind, a spell-binding joy for the heart and soul which long for the open, untouched, uncontrolled, and unmarred spaces that are a necessity for our spiritual being. It is just as important for the mind to know without the eyes seeing. There is comfort, a reassurance that out there is something righteous and good, something pure, something as wild as our primitive souls. That no matter how we try to deny, there is this primal connection existing within us. It remains no less significant than the water of which we are made, or the blood that flows within us. There is, in unspoiled land, a freedom and solace. For while the feet may become complacent, the mind will always wander. With visual freedom, our minds can unclutter the onslaught of the world's negativity. Why is the Yukon, or Alaska, or Australia's outback so free? It's not because the laws are decidedly different by constitutional decree or proclamation, but because they abound with open space. Mountains are rarely climbed, streams are fished as much by animals as humans, and there is plenty of space for both man and beast. Some things capture our imagination, like Canada geese migrating south, or salmon hurling themselves valiantly up river rapids. We need not know where these creatures are going, or from where they've come. We need only to be mystified by their great travels. I remember as a boy, plopping a makeshift sailboat into the river's current. It didn't matter if it beached itself just beyond my sight around the water's bend. The tiny boat sailed in my mind on the winds of my imagination. I need not know where it went, only that it was out there somewhere. It journeyed to the sea of my soul. So it is with the comfort of knowing that out there, somewhere in the great beyond, is an untamed slice of wildness as free as we long to be. We need to know that we will once again hear the whistle of traveling wings. We'll once again see the flash of silver surging forth in the streams. We need to know that somewhere in the farthest reaches of the globe, there is earth that thunders with the rumble of a half million running hooves. We need to know that these things exist even though most of us will never visit them. It is in the knowing that we will find our comfort that whales and dolphins will swim free and leap with grace, that the sun will shine after the fiercest storm, and the full moon will smile again next month, that caribou and wolves will roam undisturbed. We need to know that there will always be wild places out there for our soul's salvation, whether we ever visit them or not. We need to know. By the time I traveled from Algodones to Tuck, I traveled some 6,500 miles. And if you count the return trip to Arizona, where I will do another winter, you could probably double that. Over 13,000 miles. It was enough mileage to drive more than halfway around the world. And it felt like I'd entered another world, one that few people know. It left an indelible impression on me that will last a lifetime. So while there may have been annoyances or adversity on the journey, it turned out to be the journey of a lifetime. And for a guy like me, the journey is the destination. I hope you enjoy driving to the top of the world on the Dempster Highway with me. Don't forget to give me a like on the video, share, and subscribe. Until next time, this is Rockhopper. I'll see ya. I won't pass this way.